Dear friends, welcome to the International Roundtable on Planetary Mass Extinction. Is the Earth on the verge of another mass extinction? Are we aware of the real situation on our planet? Today, we will discuss this topic with our guests from different countries all over the world. I'm glad to introduce our respected speakers who are successful opinion leaders in their spheres. First, I'd like to introduce Neil Martinez from the United States, Associate Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. Next, we have Yaroslav Melnik from Ukraine. He's a Doctor of Philosophy, Professor of General and German Language Studies at the uh, Precarpathian National University. <laughs> Next, we have Tom Eddington, also from the United States. He's a strategic advisor and coach, managing director at Eddington Advisory Services, CEO at Endangered. And lastly, we have Dr. Shali Mukherjee, sorry if I mispronounced that, from India. She's the director of uh, the School of Education and Dean of Student Affairs at Adams University in India. Is a global thought leader and inspirational speaker. Thank you so much, Sean. Welcome, dear guests. And today, our online discussion is held in continuation of the conference, uh, Global Crisis. This already affects everyone. And this event actually united people from more than 180 countries of the world and was simultaneously interpreted into 72 languages. And already today, already now, while we are talking, uh, people are preparing for the next major conference that will take place on December 4th, 2021, Global Crisis, Time for the Truth. It is time to find out the truth about the environmental situation on our planet and global climate crisis. And to make sure that this information is open and accessible to all people, this event will be simultaneously interpreted into 100 languages. And all this is done voluntary, and we encourage everyone to participate. So please join us for this unprecedented event. And Right now, I would like to suggest us watching a short video about the conference that was held exactly two months ago, Global Crisis. This already affects everyone. Modern civilization has entered the stage of instability and global crisis. The future has already arrived. In the field of artificial intelligence, I really understand that today we see tremendous opportunities and possibilities. We will have human level intelligence in terms of problem solving uh, that we could have that pretty soon. And in the consumer society we live in today, it will leave us jobless. Hello, you are fired. Every owner of some corporation will create a number of machines, fill it with artificial intelligence, so a human being will simply become out of demand in this chain. Millions of people around the world have already become climate refugees. The events are developing at a shocking speed. The force of cataclysms is growing in progression. Their frequency is increasing every day. What you can see here is in red are the amount of this particular uh, uh, characteristic of uh, the planet, you know, that is left. And we can see that in many cases we have lost more than 60, 50, 60, 70 percent of this particular ecosystem or species. We are eating our planet. Maybe it's time we realize our responsibility and solve our problems together. Because sudden large-scale natural disasters occur on the planet on a daily basis. And there are fewer and fewer safe places. Soon everyone will be hungry, barefoot, naked. Because of consumerism, we are the generation that will see it through. 
Either we can stand up to it or it will end with us. One hundred eighty countries on the platform of Alatra International Public Movement. It is broadcast live on thousands of YouTube and other streaming channels. Moreover, thanks to volunteers from around the world who understand the importance of this event, the conference is simultaneously translated into seventy-two languages. The main value in a creative society is human life, your life, the life of your children, your loved ones. Only together can we find solutions. And we all want peace and happiness. And together we can create this world. So let's get started with some questions. My first question goes to Neo Martinez. Neo, can you please share your impressions of the conference? How relevant, in your opinion, is it to continue to discuss the topics raised at the conference? I think it's incredibly relevant. The way that information travels through society, it um, there's a lot of, I would call it distractions about a different whatever pop stars or political dialogues that distract us from the material reality of the crisis of our planet. There is, uh, I really enjoy the conference's emphasis on a variety of different uh, perspectives that cut through a lot of the chatter that we're inundated with, advertisements, that sort of thing. So there's a major crisis going on. It's about the environment. It's about our impact on the environment. And we need to be talking about that. Thank you so much, Mr. Martinez. And it's indeed, uh, we have so many things going on right now. The situation is getting worse with each day and we truly need to realize it. And right now I would like to address the next question to uh, Mr. Yaroslav Melnik. Uh, could you please share what your impressions, you know, what shocked you or inspired you the most after watching the conference? Thank you, um, dear participants of, the, of this dialogue. It is necessary to uh, realize that uh, there is a very um, strong platform now in the global uh, scale that is um, organ organized locally and um, has collected the arguments um, that can then be voiced um, to the uh, modern economic um, business and economic progress, which practically ignores the common uh, human values and uh, the person, a uh, human uh, world and um, it gets is developing uh, according to its own uh, laws according to the laws of fight for leadership and uh, in particular uh, areas and finally there is a platform um, that is uh, able to gather the voices ideas um, all over the planet that can react um, and uh, can provide counter arguments and um, can deliver um, its own um, uh, ways. And so the the reason the the way that the conference itself touches on uh, many different problems. Um, that can work in certain direction. So finally, I think uh, the evolution, the human evolution uh, and the uh, culture 
evolution of the culture has received a, a model um, that can take on the functions of st stabilizing our uh, reality. And so, um, certainly, this is all very important. And also, uh, it's very important that the problems of ecology and uh, instability of our world are connected to uh, uh, the instability that is spiritual, moral, and cultural. And um, this is a consequence um, of uh, a certain destabilization of, uh, of the uh, collective. So um, I really hope um, that uh, in the future and, uh, there will be new constructive counter arguments um, to uh, the consumer society. And so um, this way uh, we'll be able to create um, a certain system of reactions to these kinds of um, moments that um, destroy our world today. So um, I, uh, I feel very positively towards uh, what has uh, been voiced and uh, the topics um, that need separate discussions um, and deeper analysis as well. So I'm very happy and I support um, uh, the majority of all the speakers and the ideas that have sounded. Thank you, Yaroslav. Indeed, an evolution of of not only our way of thinking, but how our society works fundamentally is needed in order to face the coming cataclysmic changes that are happening to our planet. Tom, my question is off to you now. What, do you, what did you think about the conference? What were your impressions? Yeah, thank you. I, uh, I really enjoyed the conference. Uh, for me, it's, you know, the, the diversity of topics is, uh, has already been referenced is, uh, is important. Um, you know, part, part of the challenge we have as a species is we don't think systemically. And what I appreciated about the conference was touching on all of the different pieces of the system. Um, but my, my concern is that to know is not enough. Um, you know, it's, it's great that the content is being created, it's being captured, it's being transferred out to the world. But um, we have a sense of urgency uh, as a species if, if we're going to survive. And we need to be moving to action. And so the, the content ne needs to be captured. It needs to be disseminated out into the world. But we need to be moving into action as well. And you know, we're, we're certainly seeing it with, with COVID-19. Um, humanity thinks in a very linear and rational way. And the virus is a nonlinear um, um, virus. And we're seeing the same thing with, with climate change. We're thinking very incrementally as a species, and we're being reminded by nature that the world doesn't work that way. So we, we need a nonlinear social change to respond to the, um, the, the crises that we're facing as a species. Thank you so much, Mr. Eddington. And truly, we need to uh, build partially some, some part of the world basically needs to realize that there are problems, that there are issues that need to be solved. And of course, we need to, uh, you know, take this responsibility and start acting and start uniting and start basically uniting all our efforts uh, and our scientific knowledge base that we have uh, in order to overcome all these difficulties that we are facing, facing right now and will face in the near future too. And I would like to address the question to uh, Dr. Shauli. Could you also please share your impressions of the conference? What are your thoughts um, about it? What did you like the most? Uh, sure, uh, thank you so much. So uh, for me, I see this uh, international conference on global crisis as a very, very important and a significant pointer towards uh, you know, important issues that are happening all around us. 
So what is extremely important to me is the fact that the conference has been able to generate or create that awareness and that uh, you know sense of urgency among people. So especially it has touched almost all parts of the globe and we have speakers and uh, you know we have people from all parts of the globe who have actually come together and they have shared their ideas on such a pertinent issue. So for anything and for any matter in that sense of the term, if you really want to create an impact, the first step is definitely to create an awareness around it and to acknowledge the fact that, yes, these are the things that are really happening to us. So I think the conference in the very first, uh, you know, uh, in the very first instance has been able to create that awareness it has been able to create that sense of urgency and that sense of acknowledgement among the people that yes it is happening and this needs an urgent action on our part and definitely the second part would be you know assuming that ownership and responsibility and understanding that we are responsible for whatever is happening around us and only that kind of sense of responsibility and ownership will actually propel us towards any positive action. And then when you start taking the action on your own, I'm sure that will definitely you know, have a kind of a ripple effect and a lot of people will be inspired by your example and they will also join the mission. And then, uh, you know, the true sense of the term, the movement for any kind of positive transformation will begin. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaoli. And, you, you know, I totally agree with you and uh, all our speakers, uh, you know, about the fact that once you realize that there is a problem, you are the one who is able to fix it. And if you want to see any changes in, in the world, basically start, you know, start doing the changes yourself. Um, thank you so much, dear speakers. And, you know, one of the topics, uh, one of the basically main topics that was raised at the conference was the topic of climate crisis and climate change. And right now, I would like to suggest us watching uh, an excerpt from the conference uh, about one of the threats uh, of the climate change. Shocking news of 2021 that you will not find in the headlines of world mass media. Air and water are disappearing from our planet. Unknown radiation from outer space is slowly killing people. Slowly? Not really. In 2021, scientists from the LHAASO Observatory discovered ultra-high energy cosmic accelerators within the Milky Way. Short-term, but very powerful outbursts of radiation occur when dense neutron stars collide with each other, supernovas explode, or when stars or planets disappear in black holes. Such hard radiation is rapidly destroying the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere. It can trigger acid rains all over the planet. In the absence of the ozone layer, intensive UV radiation, along with abundant acid rain, will be able to destroy all life on Earth in the shortest possible time. This is happening because the sun's magnetic field, which protects us from dangerous cosmic rays, has significantly weakened as the sun is now at its minimum. At the exact moment when deadly radiation flies to us from the depths of space, the sun protection is minimal. Galactic cosmic rays reach the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere and destroy it. This is accompanied by increased volcanic activity, earthquakes, and extreme weather events. But worst of all, we're at risk of losing oxygen and water. After all, it is the atmosphere that keeps the conditions for life on Earth. And the situation gets even more serious due to the fact that the Earth's magnetic field 
the protective dome that protects us against threats from outer space has begun to burst at the seams. There are already huge areas where the protection has critically weakened. Thus, the Brazilian magnetic anomaly, in fact, an energy hole has increased to an unprecedented size. It is already reaching the west coast of Africa and continues to grow. The strength of the magnetic field over the western hemisphere is weaker than over the eastern hemisphere, and it continues to destroy itself. It is also anomalous that at the moment the drift velocity of the magnetic north pole has increased sixfold. In addition, the magnetic field itself is rapidly weakening. This indicates that the magnetic poles are beginning to invert, during which the magnetic field may even disappear completely for a period of time. Solar shielding is minimal. The Earth's electromagnetic field is weakened, and the stratosphere, which preserves oxygen, has decreased by 400 meters because of our activities. What is the danger to us? A little more, and cosmic radiation will kill us all. Doesn't this news deserve front page coverage in every publication in the world? Does it not deserve that we all pay attention to it? While our attention is directed to making money, the race for alpha superiority, conflicts, the destruction of life and atmosphere is taking place. Even a child understands that we will not survive without air. Many people dream of flying to Mars a planet without atmosphere and life. Very soon, Martian landscapes could be seen on our planet. To save life on Earth, or to remain indifferent to its destruction. Life or death of all humankind. This is the choice every one of us is facing now. And um, right now, I would like to address the question to um, Mr. Melnick. Uh, we understand that this climatic situation that we have in the world is worsening with every day. And um, the climate refugees is one part, like a, a huge consequence of this problem of this issue. So in your opinion, how critical is the situation with refugees right now in the world? And if we won't change anything that, you know, do we really have a chance for, you know, the, the survival and the chance to basically peacefully manage this migration of billions of people? Спасибо большое. Thank you very much. Участники нашего сегодняшнего диалога. Dear participants of today's dialogue, I would like to point out. Время от времени звучит, что I have this thought from time to time um, that uh, I've heard this thought from time to time that humanity doesn't realize this, but. Uh, there, there are many uh, caring people, people who realize the uh, severity of our times and how responsible we are for what's going to happen in the near future and in the future. And I would say it, uh, there's not a huge percentage of people that uh, are concerned with the situation, the climatic situation today. But um, of course, I believe that these people um, are united around this platform where we are uh, communicating uh, today. And it is uh, uh, really nice um, to know that the number of these people uh, is increasing around the planet. And, uh, and uh, soon, I believe, uh, there, uh, uh, there will be uh, something that will balance our efforts. 
the most uh, destructive influence uh, on our planet uh, happens uh, because of big business, uh, big uh, economics, uh, big money, that um, in the fight for survival, at the level, at the highest levels um, that are defined by big business and big economics, there, there are no uh, voices uh, we can hear there that are sounding here today. Uh, so a lot of it depends on big politics and big economics. And in order for the voice of a person who cares about the future generation uh, to be heard, uh, consolidation is necessary. I uh, believe uh, it's, we need to not just unite uh, people who are volunteers and experts in different areas, uh, but also to um, somehow um, um, add in uh, someone uh, uh, from Greenpeace, representative of Greenpeace, maybe people from show business, uh, people from big politics and big economics just to get um, these voices to the higher level um, so that it's not that, that so not just people who are concerned about it here uh, but to uh, make it heard in a different format and uh, so we um, we can get um, to the consciousness and minds of people who make decisions who um, Whose, um, whose behavior um, makes a difference. So I believe we uh, need a consolidation here of, uh, first of all, these powers. So there's a center and a counterbalance mm, so that uh, if they um, give their counter arguments, they, there will be a positive result. And I'd like to also uh, point out that there are regions in the world that are uh, uh, somewhat uh, stable um, and clean, like Scandinavia and other regions where uh, these uh, these disbalances are not felt yet, these ecological disbalances. But unfortunately, um, ec ecological migration and labor mi migration, political migration of uh, refugees, um, very soon it can change the picture because um, the, uh, the pressure on the uh, nature uh, in these regions uh, will increase in these areas and it's not likely to be able to handle um, this. So um, these uh, uh, processes of migration are um, not controlled just as well as the emissions of the chemical elements into our atmosphere. And the uh, political instability um, that uh, exists on the planet uh, in certain um, regions, of course, it's a threat. But there's nowhere to hide here. There's no corner of the planet where we can find the stability. So, of course, this dialogue, um, it, it needs to uh, somehow um, wake up uh, the, these, these masses and, um, and motivate some uh, development at the higher levels. Uh, um, so we can get to the presidents and the oligarchs and people of big business um, so that they don't just de declare and say their opinion, but also um, show their reaction uh, to it. Because where there's big business, there's big money and there's big resource. And we need to um, have this uh, resource, uh, connect this resource so, so that it can 
um, get into a more humane uh, phase, uh, something that the, uh, the uh, thinkers of all uh, eras have uh, called us to, and um, all the wise men. And this should, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, should be concerned uh, with this. So consolidation and um, some kind of activation of these ideas um, and um, taking this uh, platform to um, somewhere else is um, is uh, goal number one, task number one. And every day, the uh, when we lose opportunity, um, it's uh, it's a day lost. So. We really need um, very timely reaction, very quick reaction to uh, what's happening today. So, of course, I agree with um, everyone, with all the speakers um, uh, at the conference. Thank you, Yaroslav. Indeed, time is of the essence. Time is very short. And if we don't unite soon, there won't be much left, much time left for us to do anything to mitigate the coming crises. Indeed, it's not enough just to acknowledge that, that there's a crisis, that there's a problem. These problems need to be elevated to the, the highest levels of government and, and power and money in order for there to be real change, because as we know, those are the main drivers of change in our planet. So please, everyone watching, do as much as you can to spread the message. And also, let's start to think of ways that we can start acting now, today. And Tom, my next question is for you. We see so many crises in our contemporary society, ecological, political, economic, climatic, et cetera. We as humans, there really is a question of how are we gonna survive as humanity? What are the chances of our survival in this current format of society that we live in? What is your opinion? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I, I'm hardwired as, a, uh, as an optimist but I'm also very pragmatic. Um, I am, I'm, I'm optimistic that we are going to survive as a species uh, against a lot of the evidence that suggests otherwise. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the films I released last year was uh, a film called The Third Harmony. And it's about the true nature of humanity that we are a nonviolent species. We're, we come into this world hardwired for collaboration and cooperation. And uh, you know, in the in the film, we document from a biological perspective, from a sociological perspective, from a psychological perspective, from a neurological perspective, how we're wired as a species. And so, for me, the, the film is an opportunity to to retell the the true story of humanity. We all have been indoctrinated with this false interpretation or misinterpretation of, of Charles Darwin's work 150 plus years ago about survival, uh, survival of the fittest. And um, it's, a, it's a misappropriation of, of what he actually wrote about. Um, so I, I'm actually very optimistic that as a species, we will survive because we're hardwired for collaboration and cooperation. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not in any way dismissing the fact that President Kennedy was the first U.S. president to be advised of climate change. And every single president since the early 1960s has been told about climate change. And yet we've continued here in the U.S. and, and I think around the world continue to kick the can down the road. We'll let the next generation deal with it. We'll let the next generation deal with it. And part of the challenge is we're constantly being presented with a false choice. About a decade ago, I worked in California to ban plastic bags. And the industry, the plastic bag industry, created this false choice, this false narrative of paper versus plastic. And the reality is it's single-use versus multi-use bags. And as consumers, as human beings, as individuals, we need to be constantly aware of what are, what are the choices that we're being presented with and are they false choices? And so when we look at, at climate change specifically, there's about 300 gigatons of excess CO2 in the atmosphere. And we contribute about 10 gigatons a year on top of that. And when we look at what are possible solutions, 
Reforesting the planet will sequester about 100 of those 300 gigatons of, of CO2. Restoring the oceans would restore or would, uh, would result in sequestering about 70 gigatons. Restoring the soil, we've lost half the topsoil on the planet in the last 150 years. Restoring the topsoil would result in about 116 gigatons being sequestered. Restoring the grasslands, we don't even know how much they would contribute. But if we look at what's one of the leading drivers of the deforestation, of the destruction of the oceans, destruction of soil, it's agriculture. And the agriculture industry contributes 25% of the CO2 that's, that's going into our atmosphere. 75 or 71% of water use on the planet is by the agriculture industry. 25% of the energy use on the planet is through the agriculture industry. And yet about a third of all food on the planet is wasted. And so when we think about what are the things that we can do, one really simple solution is to look at agriculture, look at how we're growing food, how we're consuming food, and the choices we're making around food production, food consumption. And so it's easy to point to the, you know, the, the leaders of the countries, to big business to say, what is it that they can do? And yet there's a responsibility that we as individual consumers, individual citizens of, of planet Earth can be doing on a daily basis, the choices we're making around transportation, around food, around the, the kind of structures that we're living in and uh, how, we're, how we're choosing to live our lives. And so, yes, we, we very much have to shift away from a, a petroleum energy source but we also have to shift away from a petroleum economy. And that, that comes down to personal choice. And it, it's very daunting. And it's, it's very hard for individuals to say, what's the difference I can make? And yet it's a, it's a choice every single moment of, of our lives around what do we consume and how do, how do we, what are the choices we're making? So you know, to your question, I, I continue to be an optimist uh, about the survival of the species, because I, I genuinely believe in the science, all the scientific data su suggests that we are hardwired for collaboration and cooperation, but we have to shift our consciousness. And that's, that's the work that I do is working with leaders to um, help them become more conscious leaders and lead more conscious organizations to make it possible for us to, to survive as a species. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Eddington. And, um, you know, while you were speaking, uh, especially, you know, describing, giving the statistics and describing uh, the real situation that we have right now in the world, um, I, you know, I had a thought that the root of everything, the root of all these false choices is this consumption, this mm -hmm. consumption that everything is oriented about. And uh, we understand that this mind shifting, as you said, is really necessary right now, because just as you gave the example of the food, the third of all food that we produce is being wasted, right? Uh, how in the world this happens? And we understand that this is all about, you know, about money, basically, not about human being, not about the well-being of our planet and of all people in the world. So it is really, really vitally necessary, necessary right now to um, basically start acting, start doing the conscious choice, uh, and yes, start uniting and collaborating with each other. And um, Right now, I would like to address to uh, Dr. Shouli, um, you as a representative of, uh, you know, the field of um, education in India, um, in your opinion, uh, is there enough information for people to basically make the right decisions, right choices in their life and in society as a whole? And how important is it right now to educate people about the true causes of the climate change on the planet and basically its um, intensity, its uh, scale, and the threats that are waiting for us uh, basically tomorrow? Thank you so much uh, for the question. 
So it's absolutely relevant. It's absolutely essential to educate people around these uh, issues. And uh, it's not only about a particular region or a particular nation. It's about the entire world. So uh, I think the time has come when we all have realized that we are already living uh, in a VUCA world. Uh, that is, it's a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world where we are faced with unheard of challenges almost on a daily basis. So that has in fact become the new normal for all of us. And uh, we also have to realize that along with the climate crisis, which is creating uh, such a big havoc uh, everywhere, there is also another crisis which also needs our significant uh, focus and concentration. And I'm talking about the crisis in the field of human resources. We have to understand that even human resources are very much like natural resources. You know, they're also often buried deep and uh, they do not show up unless you really make an effort uh, to, you know, uh, to spot them out and to create suitable conditions for them where they can actually thrive. So COVID has actually proved, you know, this global pandemic has actually proved that there is absolutely no substitution to human resources and to human potential because the world right now does not require mechanically trained minds, minds which are loaded with facts and figures, minds which are systematically formulated to think alike. No, that is not what the world requires right now. So what the world requires are actually creative minds and innovative minds, minds which are capable of divergent thinking, minds which are capable of out-of-the-box ideation. That is what the world requires right now. So in case of any problem, if you want to really solve that particular problem, you cannot solve that particular problem with a mechanically trained mind. Because we have to understand that the world does not care how much you know but the world definitely cares about the fact that what you decide to do with what you know. And for that, it is extremely important for each one of us to understand why we are doing what we are doing. So I'm talking about the purpose. I'm talking about the purpose in the sense if, because you, because you have, uh, you know, posed a question to me about education or about educating the minds. So unless education enables us to find out the real purpose of our existence or about our survival. If we, are, if we are unable to spot what is the purpose for which we exist or how is it that we are going to create a positive and visible and tangible difference in the lives of many people around us. I mean, if education fails to do that, then there is a serious problem. Also, if uh, the proper education can make us realize the fact that the very fact that we still continue to exist on the face of this planet is an ample testimony to the fact that we do matter. So if, if it hadn't been so, we wouldn't have existed, right? So we matter. And we are actually not human beings with you know, spiritual experiences, but we are spiritual beings with human experiences. So education or real education or true education in that sense of the term will actually make us realize all these uh, things and will also help us to understand that it is not cutthroat competition. It's not, you know, running in that rat race that will actually enable us to gain anything out of it. So it is ultimately, uh, you know, the two important and skill sets that will enable uh, enable all of us to enable all of us to actually you know thrive in the 21st century VUCA world happens to be collaboration and cooperation and not cutthroat competition. So it is not about making a human cry about intelligence quotient or IQ. It is about developing in each and every child, each and every human being the essential other components or other quotients. And by that, I mean EQ, you know, uh, emotional quotient, CQ, creativity quotient, PQ, passion quotient, HQ, happiness quotient, SQ, spiritual and social quotient. And most importantly, uh, what COVID has, you know, taught all of us 
is that we need to hold and nurture AQ, that is adversity quotient. How to deal with the vagaries of life, how to deal with the uncertainties of existence. So true education or real education will actually enable all of us to realize these basic facts. So if there is uh, the absence of education, then obviously there will be a lot of problems. So I'm not trying to say that whatever is happening around us, be it in the form of climate crisis or be it in the form of anything whatsoever, education is the root cause of all the problems. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm definitely trying to make a point here that education can definitely be a solution to all the problems that we're facing currently. Wow, thank you so much for your, um, for your speech there. Absolutely. Uh, the problem we've heard cannot be addressed in, in one way. Clearly, there are nonlinear problems that, that humans tend to face in a linear fashion. We've heard that, that the human resource is the greatest resource. Uh, we've heard that humans are hardwired for cooperation and problem solving to extend the, our, our, our existence here on Earth. So how do we do it? Neil, I'd like to ask you another question. We often hear about the problem of overpopulation. At the conference, it was voiced that 8 billion is exactly the number of people which is needed to make global changes in our planet. It's possible only when we unite as the whole human potential. But how can each person understand that he or she is very important in that process and that everything depends on the choice of each person? What do you think? I, I think that much of that is true, that people need to realize their power for change, their power in creating change. Many, uh, perhaps most of the people now, are able to have some choice in their government, being able to vote for politicians um, that, and being able to spread their ideas to others that can vote for politicians. And so we have movements such as Greta Thunberg, a wonderful example of activism and the Sunrise Movement that's associated with Greta, Greta Thunberg. Those are some uh, uh, groups, that, uh, those are some minds that do think systemically about how to cooperate and create the change we need to see. In the states, we have the Green New Deal that is a political movement to address very, I think, intelligently and deeply the causes of climate change and so many other issues. You've brought up the issue of that's called overpopulation. I think that is, again, and there's overpopulation, consumerism, those sorts of issues can often distract from um, the important changes that need to be made. For instance, it's the number of people you don't present that much of a problem to the amount of resources that we have on the planet. It's much more of an issue of distribution of resources. There is enough food to feed everyone, but that food is not distributed in a just manner. The rich countries are able to hoard resources and the poor countries are being um, basically ripped off of their resources. And so population as an environmental problem is a convenient way to point away from rich nations who have a low population growth rate towards poor nations that have often high population growth rates. And so by distraction, pointing towards poor people with much less power and pointing away from rich people and their corporations and their political representatives, those the lobbyists that support politicians, those that's a big problem, that distraction. We need to refocus, as I think Greta Thunberg's uh, and the Sunrise Movement has done, as the New Green Deal does in the States, to the United States, they are a, I think, deep thinking social change agents that have 
good solutions to the problems. These problems are complex. They are nonlinear. They are um, difficult to understand. Those of us who spend our lives understanding them um, and studying them, uh, you know, it's it's a wonderful occupation. It's a wonderful uh, gift to be able to study our world, study our species. I'm an ecosystem ecologist. I study how interdependence of organisms. I am also a very much a critic of uh, Darwin's struggle for existence and think a party for existence might be a much more um, it, uh, useful way to consider how populations interact. That is, we help each other out. We find partners on this planet. Some of our partners are cotton plants or wheat or corn. Those cooperative, mutualistic relationships between ourselves and other species is what we need to develop to address the problems that we see. I think the political movements getting voting for leaders that see this clearly, that have specialists that understand it, we've, uh, is the way to solve these sorts of issues. We've th seen with COVID, the groups, uh, the countries such as South Korea or New Zealand that have embraced scientists and their understanding, uh, China as well, have been able to really uh, basically conquer the COVID pandemic. Those countries that have ignored the scientists, uh, our country, the United States, in, especially in some states, Brazil, other countries that have ignored the scientists have suffered. I think that's a wonderful, um, wonderful, uh, terrible example, but very illuminating example of what we need to do when it comes to a complex problem, a nonlinear problem, a problem that demands cooperation. What we need to do is focus uh, our resources towards the more, I would say, sophisticated understanding um, that is developed by folks, again, like Greta Thunberg, the Sunrise Movement, and the New Green Deal. It's not the number of people that is uh, that are on the planet. It's how we organize to create cha the change we need to ha see happen in the world. Thank you so much, Mr. Martinez, and uh, thank you for your such an interesting point of view and for these practical examples that we already see happening in the world. And um, we actually see that there are a lot of good examples in different countries that we need to gather all together and implement worldwide, you know, take the best and practice it, implement it and, you know, just uh, live it up right? Um, thank you so much. And also, I would like to um, address my question to uh, Mr. Eddington. Um, so, basically, what can people do right now to make the world better, you know, to improve our relationships, to unite the the global, the whole world community, as Mr. Martinez just said, that we need to collaborate. We need to, you know, put all our knowledge together, put all our ideas and efforts together. So, Mr. Eddington, in your opinion, how can we do this? How can we make this change for the better? Um, I, I wish you had asked me an easier question. <laughs> I, I don't, I certainly don't have the answers. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge we have is that we all live our lives in, in, with a certain paradigm that we're operating in. And the, the, the challenge we have is to shift the paradigm that we're living our lives. And, and that's not easy. I mean, each of us, we see the world, we've been conditioned to see the world literally from, from the moment we were, we were conceived. And, uh, you know, from early childhood, our familial relationships, the books that we've read, the movies that we've watched, the, the TV programs, where we went to school, the communities that we grew up in has all shaped our worldview. And it, it, it's very, very challenging for us 
to, to change the story of, of our lives, to change the way we see the world. And it, it is that shift in consciousness that um, first requires acknowledging that the way we see the world has been conditioned. And then to, to make a decision to actively choose to, to, to shift the paradigm, to shift our consciousness. And it's, it's a lifelong journey. It's, it's not easy. But there are, there, you know, it's in part questioning everything about the choices we make, what informed the choices that we made uh, or that we're making constantly. And um, that, that's, it's, it's incredibly challenging to do that, but that's where it has to start. Our belief systems, our, our orientation, and you know, talk, talking for a moment about um, the world population, we're at 8 billion. Um, if you look at the statistics, the, the world population of humans is going to grow to 11 billion. Um, and the, the carrying capacity of the earth can handle that 11 billion if we're living on the, on the earth in a different way than we are now, if we're consuming in a different way, if we're in relationship with each other in a different way. But um, that, that requires a shift in consciousness. And we're at about 85 million um, people on the planet who are climate refugees. That number is going to grow to 200, billion, 200 million by the end of this decade. And ultimately, probably around a, a billion people are going to be climate refugees over the next 30 years. And that's going to force us to to be with each other in a very different way, to see what does it mean to be human in a very different way, to make choices in how we're living our lives in a very different way. And it's not going to be easy, that transition. The good news is, as a species, we're hardwired for change. We're really excited about change. We're actively looking for change on a daily basis. But it's that transition that happens after that change point that's really hard for us. And so being resilient, being open to, to the transitions that are necessary is what's, what's going to be required. But it, it goes back to that shift in consciousness that, that I mentioned before. And, um, you know, fortunately, there are conferences like the, the Global Crisis Conference and others where people are being presented with information that's an invitation to, to being open to shifting our consciousness and changing. But there has to be that willingness, there has to be the desire, there has to be the opportunity for us to live our lives from a place of trust rather than fear. And unfortunately, here in the U.S., we perfected the marketing of fear, business, government, um, and we've exported that to the rest of the world. And so part of that shift in human consciousness is to recognize we're, we're we're, we're living our lives from fear, and we need to be living our lives from, from love. And love is the energy of the universe. And so if we can be open to that, if we can be receptive to that, if we can be living our lives from that place, that will enable us to shift our consciousness, which is necessary. Thank you, Tom. I absolutely agree. We live in fear, and fear, unfortunately, has left us uh, into inaction and finding amongst ourselves about things that are distracting us from the larger problems going on in the world and with our planet. What will it take for a global consciousness shift in everyone to start to get everyone to start to tackle this issue all hands on deck? Hopefully there's enough time that we can figure it out together because we can't do it alone. Yaroslav, I'd like to ask you, you've mentioned many times that we need to unite. In your opinion, how can all people around the world unite and love and build the creative society in the shortest period of time? Thank you very much uh, to the previous speakers for everything that's been said. I think it's all realistic and, and um, it really uh, coincides with the picture of the world that uh, we have currently. Um, 
I believe that to change it quickly uh, and with great results um, is going to be somewhat difficult, but it will be possible to do if the leaders of the countries and political um, governments uh, of the countries uh, will be uh, involved. Uh -huh. But I think, I think that we are uh, leaving out uh, a very important point here. We're just not emphasizing it. I think that we are... Um, not completely understanding what a human is, what culture is, um, why if a person has uh, started living better, he continues to want a higher level uh, of life and uh, more, why um, the, uh, a stable enough uh, world um, does not uh, give him enough stability, it doesn't change uh, the vector um, of uh, his relationship with the surrounding world. So it's uh, like uh, just a paradox of uh, an educated person. Uh, of course, I, I agree that we need to educate, um, but uh, my dear colleagues, um, let's just imagine that uh, there's some part of the population of Africa in uh, some regions um, that don't allow the person to live uh, to their full capacity or some other continents. Uh, they won't accept um, these standards, these civilized world standards. And, uh, it's very possible that they will continue to live according to some kind of traditional um, schemes, and they won't accept um, um, these things. Um, so there's uh, some sort of a paradox here. I think uh, possibly we need to... Um, uh, go to some kind of uh, sociological centers or um, centers on um, studying cataclysms and crises um, on the social um, um, and cultural level. And, uh, so it's possible then the, the researchers um, of demographics and philosophy and sociology together, um, when they get together, maybe they can, if not give us an answer, to maybe just um, give us uh, some kind of a sketch uh, and show us the reasons of why uh, a person remains a consumer and an egoist um, towards the surrounding environment um, and why uh, often uh, savings um, just lose all uh, common sense and you know the society suffers because of it and the planet suffers and ecology and everything logically this shouldn't be happening but um, according to the paradigm of our uh, interpretation of the world this shouldn't be happening but it still exists so i think um it just we we are missing something there's something we are not um accounting for maybe a multifaceted uh, approach um it needs to happen to the uh, human and his world. And um, so the sociologists say, um, okay, but um, what can we do to um, for the person not to wait, you know, to the uh, uh, to uh, some other uh, time, but uh, even in this generation, to start um, uh, behaving differently towards his neighbor and his uh, uh, surrounding environment uh, for, in order for it to happen in the next um, decade and not, uh, and not to wait for some kind of cataclysms of a global scale. 
Just to work more intensively, um, I think uh, probably we need some kind of new um, interpretations of uh, a human as a social being. And maybe there's a question, uh, there's an answer there. Uh, maybe sociologists and other um, uh, close to that um, fields and researchers can um, shed some light and uh, give us uh, some, some clues. Um, it's impossible that there, there's no way out of a situation. Of course, um, the situation is quite difficult and everything the colleagues are saying, it's not an exaggeration, it's absolutely true. Um, so that's why um, maybe uh, we uh, need to um, work on uniting sociologists and researchers and, and, um, and uh, give them this uh, global um, task of, you know, how can we change the human being um, as, a, as a social being? Maybe uh, we even need to speak about some kind of a cultural revolution. I don't want to really raise this uh, topic, but the inside of a person requires reconstruction because the consumer, a uh, person who's a consumer remains a consumer and um, it just uh, continues. So um, he just loses control and uh, with his negative self, and this negative self uh, dictates the behavior um, and his social uh, model of behavior um, in relation to the surrounding reality. So uh, probably we uh, do need to somehow uh, connect uh, the centers and institutes of research um, in, in search uh, for the answer to this question, because I think right now we don't have um, this kind of uh, concept yet. Of, um, yeah, we talk about it. It's, uh, it's already very good, a very big achievement, but um, we need to uh, look for ways out of the situation, so we need to connect people who can give us some clues, maybe like that. So thank you, and I will continue to attentively listen to the colleagues, it's all very interesting, thank you. Thank you, you so much, uh, Mr. Melnik, and uh, really thank you a lot for emphasizing this really important point that, uh, you know, apart from all the issues, all the crises that we have right now in the world, the main, probably the, the most global crisis that we have is inside of each one of us. And basically uh, putting all our efforts together to find out who is a true human being and how we all together can uh, basically live with each other without, you know, without all the um, negative things that we have, right? But uh, basically bringing forward all the best, all the good that we have inside of us and support each other in this. And also uh, in the beginning of your speech, you mentioned that it would probably be a great idea to um, contact the um, opinion leaders, the, the politicians and so on. And as we know that... Um, if we take a look at, at our world, right, uh, the political systems, in the percentage, there are probably at least one or even less percent of the politicians. But yes, they are forming the opinions of big groups of people. And for us, uh, as people, we need to take this responsibility as well. We need not to wait and, uh, you know, sit here and wait that somebody will come and fix all the issues for me. No, it's just we have to become those uh, active, uh, you know, human beings. We need to take action right now all together uh, for this unity. And also just a little spoiler, right? Little teaser for, for the next conference that is gonna be held on the 4th of December, 
We are already in the, in the process of contacting the um, leaders of different countries, uh, leaders of opinion leaders and celebrities as well, so that uh, more and more people could get informed with the help of these people, because we understand that they have a lot of influence, they have a lot of followers, and they would be, um, you know, um, the great examples of spreading the words of unity all over the world. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. And um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Shauli um, another question. So in your opinion, how important is it right now to openly share the truthful information about the climate situation on the planet? And basically, not only regarding climate, you know, the situation that we are in right now. And also, what would be your message to all the people who are watching us right now and will be watching later? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> it is uh, absolutely important to spread this message because this is such a significant and important one. I think uh, we should, I mean, it's high time that we should all realize the fact that we are basically all interdependent. So interdependence is actually the key. So, uh, you know, the, we have to understand the planet doesn't exist because of us. It is because of the planet that we exist. So even if you consider a very simple dynamic of, uh, you know, something that we do every second, that is we breathe, we breathe in and we breathe out. So whatever we inhale, the trees exhale. So whatever the trees exhale, we inhale. So even if you consider this very simple dynamic, I think we will uh, you know, understand the basic fact that it's all always uh, a relationship. It's all, there is a constant transaction which is going on. There is constant partnership. There's a constant collaboration, constant relationship which is going on. So we are a part of this particular and important dynamic which we cannot deny. And also, yes, coming to the solution, I would say it will not come uh, you know, very soon or it will not come overnight because of the very fact that the problems um, which are there all around us, the problems have not been caused overnight. So the problems will also not come overnight. So it's a constant process. It's a constant process which starts uh, basically with, you know, uh, with, with our own uh, sort of understanding and acknowledging the fact that we are ourselves responsible for whatever is happening around us. So it starts with that acknowledgement. And then maybe when we start taking ownership and responsibility for our own action, then we are motivated to, uh, you know, to perform some positive action in this particular field. And also I think we have to understand that basically there are two reasons. Uh, important reasons as to why things are happening like this around us. Everything that is happening around us currently, it can be climate crisis, it can be natural calamities, it can even be wars, you know, uh, overpopulation, poverty, unemployment, uh, increasing rates of suicides, uh, mental health hazards, uh, even pandemic. So whatever is happening around us, it is actually, things are not happening to us. It's all our own doing. We are responsible for whatever is happening currently. And it's happening because of two reasons. One, being our insatiable greed and, you know, inordinate ambition. So our ambition, our aspirations level, they don't, uh, you know, currently they don't have any limits. So insatiable greed and inordinate ambition is one. And definitely, lastly, I would also like to mention that it's definitely a faulty education system, which has actually impressed upon all of us right from the very childhood that we have to be covetous, we have to be greedy, we have to be selfish, and we have to be competitive in order to exist and survive on this planet. So definitely it requires a complete uh, you know, mindset shift, a paradigm shift, and only then there will be a transformation from, if I can say, from a human being to a human becoming. 
which is the nature of Prabha. Thank you so much. I totally agree. We as humans need to cease being passive and take responsibility for our own future. Be creative in the process of creating the future that we want, not just for ourselves, but for generations to come after us. Talking about the mass extinction on our planet, we know it is a frightening topic. But unfortunately, we raise these topics because right now it's a reality that we live in. The world is changing today at such a rapid pace. Numerous crises are popping up all over the world and becoming worse. In order for us to avoid another mass extinction level event, we must unite as a human race, as one race, as one people. Because after all, is anything that we're doing now working? We're separated, we argue, and we fight over things. And yet we find every reason not to cooperate and face the challenges that face us. As we all can see, things are only getting worse. So friends, I ask you, let's unite before it's too late. There's no time for fear. There's no time for doubts. It's time to make a choice and unite in our action now. Once again, I want to thank all of our guests for coming and joining us today and sharing their insights. Also, a very big thank to you, thanks to all of the volunteers who helped prepare this roundtable, the interpreters, everyone in involved in the streaming of this roundtable and broadcast on all of the Elantra TV channels. Thank you, everyone. Indeed, Sean. Thank you so much, everyone. And I would like to pay my big gratitude to all the people who basically devote their time and effort to make such roundtables, online discussions, and conferences of such a large scale happen. And of course, thank you to our lovely guests today. Thank you for sharing your insights and opinions. And thus, uh, dear viewers, dear speakers, I would like to remind you that on um, December the 4th, 2021, there will be another huge international online conference, Global Crisis, Time for the Truth. And of course, we invite everyone to join this unprecedented event and to basically extend on the topics of ecology uh, and global clim climate change, as well as to hear the truth that concerns every one of us. And if you would like to contribute to building a better world for us, for our children, for generations to come, it is actually very, very easy to do. You can just visit the alotreunites.com website and join the Creative Society project. One more time, Thank you a lot to all our participants of the round table. And right now, let's watch a short video on how you can join the project. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. 